Okay, we're here. Good morning. Hi. Glad you're back. You got the email that has the link for last class. Good. Because that's actually on YouTube, so you can actually hear it. So, as you might know, I think it's the 14th, of, was the 100 year anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, which hit the iceberg at exactly 11.40 p.m. and was gone from sight uh, by 2.20 a.m. So I don't know if you saw that, but anyway. So, uh, you know, the saying, women and children first, right? That it just occurred to me that is the perfect motto for which hormone? I know that's a weird question. It's not on your final that you're creating, which remind me, who's writing a question for today? Thank you. Who, somebody still owes me a question for? I sent it to you yesterday. Oh, thank you. I might not have got, I haven't seen my emails. So what do you think? What hormone does that perfectly personify? And it's okay if you don't get this. Oxytocin. Well, I was thinking oxytocin, but I think it's really more vasopressin. Right? The man, I will protect you, I will care for you, all of that. Women and children first, I will sacrifice. I will stay on board and drown because women and children must have. It's perfect. It's the motto for vasopressin. Okay, speaking of things, we are the life force power of the universe. Please, if you didn't see Jill Bolt Taylor's TED Talk, I sent you the link on that. I think I didn't even, I don't, know if I, I don't think I Twittered that. I think I actually put it in an email because I know it might be harder or less frequent that you go to the Twitter, but I see, you see your email, I assume. You have got to see that. You have got to see her presentation. She's a neuroscientist who got into neuroscience because her brother's schizophrenic. And she had a stroke. And it, it, but her left, but part of her brain was totally aware of what was going on. And it's the most incredible testament to the power of the brain in general, but also to the magic mind. As she says in the left brain, I am Jill Bolt Taylor. In my right brain, I am the life force power of the universe. Wow. Not better, just different way of experiencing. I also sent you, and I think this one was a tweet, a really interesting little video on, again, I think it's a TED Talk, on ethics, on the neuro of moral behavior. And he looked at the monkey studies. And did you see the one with the little monkeys, the two monkeys, and the little food thing? If you didn't see it yet. So you, you remember the monkeys and banana, right? Fairness. Well, this one, so cute. Two little monkeys, researcher. There's the baseline food that they eat in general. And then there are grapes. They really love grapes. Well, the researcher gives baseline food to both. OK. Now he gives baseline food to one and the grapes to the other. And what does the baseline food one do? Throws the baseline food back at the researcher. Nah, I'm not taking that kid. Nah. Oh, it's amazing to watch. Just like outraged. Disgust. I take umbrage to this. Why are you giving what? Why? It's not fair. Why are you giving him or her the grape and me the pff? It's just amazing to watch. And sometimes the grape getter doesn't accept the grape. Doesn't want to offend the other one. Now what I would have loved if between the two cages they put a little thing so that the grape giver could have given the grape to the other. That would have been really interesting. The little monkey would have given the grape and then said give me another one. Okay, and the bioplasm of the being at a primate level is a sense of fairness. And his point, which I think also, is that moral behavior is really based on empathy and this fundamental, fundamental sense of fairness, which really comes from that fundamental sense of this feels right, this doesn't feel right. Right? And I talked to you about groups of feelings, mad, sad, glad, scared is one group and all that. And the other is, this feels right, this doesn't feel right. That's one of the most common things I say to little pumpkins. Even if a simple act like, eh, I'd rather play with this than play with that. You have a good sense of what feels right to you. Like, that feels right to do that, not that. And that is so important for all of us to, have, to listen to that, to be aware of that. 
on a much deeper, uh, deeper, sadder usage of that. Because again, we are the mosaic of our attachments, and we attach to principle. And really, underneath it all, this principle of fairness and right, more than life itself. So I saw a story about young brides of India. They are married off at ages between seven, seven years old, eight, nine, and 10. And what are they finding? An alarming percentage of them by age 14. It, I think the term is immolate themselves. They set themselves on fire. You know about this. It's horrific. And they burned. And it's like, you think you've got me? You think you've got me? Here, have this. Oh, it's horrific. But it occurred to me it's that same. I would rather die or I'd rather live burned from head to toe out of the principle of what's right for me. Very powerful. Okay. Is there any other little tidbit I want to tell you right now? I don't think so. All right. I also sent you some TED Talks of Ramachandran, the brilliant, wonderful neuropsych guy at UCSD. You got to see that stuff. Back to Jung. Theory of person. Theory of pathology. Theory of healing. Role of therapist. What you like, what you don't particularly like. Oh, I turn around, there's more people. Come on. So, Jung, theory of the person. What's the fundamental theory of the person? Why do we do what we do? What drives us? What motivates us? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's a really important part. But I don't know if that's what drives us. But it's certainly what he uh, made unique or, or highlighted in a way that nobody else did. Are we good? Are we bad? We're good. We're good. We're really good. Oh, yeah. Remember this little thing? Mm. Thank God they don't have the draw the rose test. With this little seedling, right? And in the seedling, already predetermined, is the destiny to bloom. Or at least the striving to bloom. It's already coded in the bioplasm of the being. Footnote, I sent you a article on epigenesis. I talked about epigenesis last time some. You gotta look at this article. I have to, it's like second and third generation impacts because environment changes. How we live our life changes our eggs and sperm, which impacts our children and our children's children and impacts death rates and, and all kinds of factors. The point of that is that the collective experience, never mind the neurobiology of the being, impacts us and then destines us in certain ways. But we strive to bloom. And do you remember what he called this striving? In, it's okay if I don't remember. Individuation. Your whole thing is to strive towards being all that you can be. Sounds like the army. Be all you can be. They took a slogan. This is an enormously humanistic concept. Basically self-actualizing. Only he sees it as a transcultural kind of way. And what gets, what's involved in this process is different than the humanistic <coughs> assumption. But it's basically his version of self-actualizing 50 years before 
that ever came into dear Carl Rogers' mind, to mind Maslow and the guys and gals. What's the relationship between the conscious and the non-conscious? Do you remember this? The seeking balance? Yes. Or there's seeking balance? Yes. If we put Jung in one word, the word is balance. It's a homeostatic system. It's, it seeks to balance itself. So you have the conscious, you have the... I call it non-conscious because it's, anyway, but he called it unconscious. You've got the personal part of it and you've got the collective part of it. You all had a mom and then the human species has a mom. Knows a mom. Ego is, bridges both. And there's this relationship. What's the difference between Siggy and Jungi in terms of their assumption about symbols? What is a symbol for Sig and what's a symbol for Carl? One is that for um, Freud, you would interpret um, symbols and then um, Young is how you relate to them. Very well said. A symbol is a bridge cast to an unseen shore. It's not a sneaky way to try and get around the censor. And again, I'm not saying that he's wrong and he's, you know, they're all right. But Sig's assumption really is that. You dream of an umbrella in a, in, in a windstorm, and the, this is a very masculine version anyway. So you dream of this umbrella in the windstorm. You know what's going to happen. Then, and suddenly you lose your umbrella. What, am I, what's the matter? Oh, no, I asked my question. Oh, okay. Correct. Correct. We're going to talk a ton about that, and we're going to do that today. What did do? Relate to the symbol. Okay, thank you. So you dream in this dream, and you're holding on to this umbrella, and suddenly, whoa, tears away. You wake up, pardon me, you're a man, holding your crotch. Because obviously the umbrella symbolizes your penis, and of course it's a castration anxiety dream. But you couldn't tolerate the thought of that, really. So it's this, your sensor, which is trying to keep you asleep, your protector, excuse my language, is just saying, hey, we're going to kind of mask this phallic symbol as an umbrella. And so that's why the therapist interprets that. There, there now, what does the umbrella remind you of? It is longer than it is wide. I told you, I told you what my psychoanalyst, full on analyst, and I'm being in psychoanalysis, not psychodynamics, psychoanalysis, on the couch lying down, and what he told me about surfing. Why I have a wave on my wedding ring. Remember what he told me? Thank you. It's my mom, it's my mom's womb, or vaginal passage or whatever. And the surfboard is the phallus, and I'm fucking my mom when I'm surfing. Hey, I'm not saying that couldn't also be true. By the way, for Jung, Freud is not symbolic enough. So if Jung said, oh, that's interesting, what does sex mean? What does that mean? What does mom represent? I mean, why stop there, dude? There's more to this. But he really believes that. For Jung, it's all about relating to symbols, Expanding them, bringing them up, because by definition, you don't know what it means. I will never fully know what a wave means in my life, ever. It's just one of those archetypal symbols that I relate to, for whatever reasons, and I probably always will relate to it. Because once you understand what a symbol is, it's no longer a symbol, but a sign. Umbrella equals phallus. Surfboard equals phallus. Wave equals my mom's womb or vaginal passage. Oh, okay. Done with that. Next. Symbols, by definition, have their mana, that mystical, mythical energy. Because we don't, in our prefrontal cortex, marvelous left brain, understand fully what they mean. We still have a sense of numinosity, which is a sense of awe. Every time I go up Torrey Pines, I look down at the shores, I can't help myself, and I see a wave, I go, oh. it still takes my breath away every time I see a wave. And I drove up to Rincon Sunday, couldn't wait to get there, surfed all day, it was about quarter of seven at night, I'm exhausted, I mean I come in, I eat a little, I go up, 
And there was another set, and there was only four guys out. And I go, you know, I'm going to go out for another session. And went out, if I could just catch one more wave, one more Rincon wave. And I did. I got two more Rincon waves. It's just me and another guy until it's basically dark. And I get in my car, and I drive home. Three hours up there, three hours back, and it's worth it for just one Rincon wave. That's aww. Aww. Okay, please, you have a thought or question or yeah, something. Th this is why in Jungian dream analysis you have the dreamer tell you what an umbrella symbolizes. For of them. course. How presumptuous would it be of me to tell you, as we did with the sand world? The first thing I said to you is, we're not going to analyze any of this. Who is it for me to say, oh, the giraffe means this or that, the other thing? And I didn't ever say to you, why did you pick this? I said, give me three words, adjectives, to describe this. Because as soon as you talk, you're talking about an aspect of yourself. Because it's a symbolic mode of reality. Everything, the chair you're sitting on, is an aspect of yourself. As soon as you start supporting or describing it. That's the marvel of the metaphoric mind with the prefrontal. If a symphony of our marvelous brain is that we immediately have, because the schema is an association to everything. Everything is a symbol for everything else or something else. All right, so we have this relationship because the unconscious is trying to tell us something. It's saying the umbrella not to be sneaky because that's the clearest way it can tell you. Maybe it's something about give me shelter. Client yesterday, love this guy, an adult, comes in and he said, God, just this morning I had the weirdest dream. It was about lost and found. He's an artist. And he said, you know, and the dream was actually literally lost and found, but I realized that is just such a great metaphor for so much that's going on in my life and so much that goes on in life in general. So we just started talking about having him associate to, expanding upon the concept of lost and found. And there's a lot that he's lost in his life right now, but he's found a lot. And he was almost murdered last weekend, and that would have been a big loss of life. And what did he find? I mean, it was just incredible, just that one little motif, lost and found. And all that he's did with it during the session, and he's going to do painting things. It's like, oh, I have found a motif. Can't wait to see him in a couple of weeks and see what else he's found out of this and lost. That's how you relate to it. It's trying to tell you something in the clearest, most fullest way it can. Okay, so given this, what's pathology in the Jungian model? If we're striving to be all we can be, if we're striving towards our destiny of blooming, why blooming well is there pathologies? You've been unconscious for too long. Exactly right. Not paying attention. You're not listening. It's not going to go away. It'll just hit the non-conscious part. We'll just talk louder. So you dream that says, you know, it'd be really good to go get a pie and julian. You need to kick back some. Your inner relaxer needs to be in charge of the inner White House. But you're not paying attention because you're very busy gets a little louder. I really need you to relax. Let's imagine if you don't relax, what's going to happen? And now you're in the library, you're studying something, and suddenly there's an earthquake, and books come crashing, or computer disks, and I guess it is, computers come crashing down, and you wake up, <gasps> I feel like apple pie. You've got to listen. You don't listen, you ignore, it will escalate, and you'll become symptomatic. Symptoms are the non-conscious ultimate or way of trying to get you to pay attention. Yes, please. Is that um, then the system is not homeostatic or it's like imbalanced? Then? It's imbalanced. It's striving for homeostasis. Homeostasis is balanced. No, so I mean, when, um, when all the symptoms are coming up, then there's an imbalance. In the absolutely, by definition. And also remember in this model, in general, life is a spiral. So you have certain themes, and you're going to come back to them. You had them at nine months, and you'll have them at 90.
And these themes are encapsulated in one sense by what he discovered and called archetypes. So what are archetypes, please? No, I understand the specific, we'll talk about specific, but what, are, what is the definition? What's an archetype? The representation of ourselves. Okay, that's good, I like that. <laughs> Your inner scholar is going, well, now wait a minute, you could have had a full answer to that. Because it's great, you looked at the stance to yourself, funny. All right, so say more, or pick somebody, say more. That's, yes, that's also true. I'm being very Socratic today. Sorry, I know it's hard. Say that again. It's the transpersonal, transcultural, transhistorical, psychoneuro, bio, endrico, whatever all you want to add. Logical. <laughs> Template of the human condition. It's these very powerful symbols of what it is to be human, that we all go through, all have gone through 30,000 years ago and will 30,000 years from now. That's one of the important ways that the non-conscious part speaks to the conscious part and guides. We use archetypes to guide us. Oh, which brings us over here then. So obviously, what heals? Rhetorically asking. Somebody who hasn't talked. Somebody who hasn't talked and hasn't done their one saying per day. Anybody? You're looking very intently. It's fantastic. I know, which is nearly impossible. I apologize. Even after all these weeks of us being together. Theory of healing role of the therapist, if that's what you're looking at. Sorry. So what do you think? Oh, you were... You weren't here last time, so that's not fair of me to ask you, actually. Were you here last time? Okay, I'm not. No, I watched the video. Oh, okay, you watched the video. Okay, then do you remember? So what's, what heals? How do we heal? If this is what pathology is, not paying attention. I mean, again, it's kind of... Isn't it listening to your, you know, trying to figure it out? Your, like, everything that happens? Yeah. 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 Yes, paying attention. <laughs> paying attention to what it is your non-conscious part is trying to guide you to do. Paying attention to the inner guide by relating, not interpreting, relating, living with. I'm going to do a bunch of examples today. Living with the important, currently up for you, so to speak, symbols. Most of humanity, by the way, has always done this and continues. That is, they don't randomly wear jewelry. They, have, they don't randomly tattoo themselves. They don't randomly poke holes in their skin. Those all have meanings for them that guide them in some way to live a fuller, as they would culturally define it, life. It's not random. Jung, in part, rude. Woo to woo, as he saw it, modern life because it was the Western life because it was devoid in many ways. We're so distant from our symbols. We're so removed. We wear jewelry just because it looks pretty, not because it has some deeper meaning necessarily. We buy fancy cars and fancy purses for the status and what it means, not for the symbol of the relationship. Again, if you look at, as I told you, in St. George Holmes, in the summer we lived the life, lived the life as authentically as we could of the Plains Indian, Native Americans, because they were so attuned to the symbolic mode of reality. And all that stuff they're painting, all that stuff they were drawn, how they lived their lives were relating to, living through with, symbol. How am I like the eagle? How am I like the mouse? It's fascinating to live that way. <sighs> okay. What's the role of the therapist? Being the co-guide in the Exactly right. You are a co-guide. Thank you for the honor and the privilege. You're representing the inner healer of that person. 
you're a co-guide. You don't interpret, you point the way. You're directive. I had, I had another adult client yesterday who, did a, who said a profound thing. He says, all my life I felt like some part of me, there's a hole inside. And I've tried so many different ways to fill it. That's a really powerful thing to say. It's a sense of emptiness. It's one part. So then I said, I mean, after a different dialogue, so what I realized is, you know, your W-H-O-L-E, you're very whole in so many, he's a very competent individual in so many ways. But because never mirrored by parents, never connected to mom and dad in certain ways, there is this certain area of intimacy, connection with a profound other that you feel not whole, but a whole. So, one of the things you could do, so now I'm being a co-guide, is, and of course it's up to you, whenever I tell anybody, it's up to you, I don't live your life, I tell you guys the same thing. You could journal, and you, and you say, well, 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 how would I start? Because you could have a discussion with that part of you that feels not whole. But, when you ask the question, or not, and, and when you ask the question, write it with your dominant hand, he's right-handed, I want him to learn about you. Tell me something about you. When you answer, write with your non-dominant hand. I've told you this trick. It's really important. If you're going to do journaling with aspects of self that are not fully integrated, conscious, whatever you want to call that, write with the non-dominant hand. Why, by the way? If I'm right-handed, exactly. If I write with my left hand, I'm going to be more bilateral into my right brain, which is the metaphoric mind, the non-dominant, that's where this stuff resides. It's going to feel more like automatic writing. Did I really just say that? Oh, wow. So that was being directive. I'm a co-guide. doesn't have to do it. Now, I'll tell that. By the way, I don't want to get into a, I'm your dad telling what you do. No, you're not going to tell me. I don't want to get into that dynamic with you. I'm a co-guide here. I'm your care coach, helping you take loving responsibility right for care yourself, integrate your archetypes. Ritual is enormously important <coughs> in the human psyche and in the human species and in the human culture. <coughs> the power of ritual. And rituals are ways to integrate, relate to, synthesize, internalize, and express the important aspects of the human condition. Bless you. Somebody have an important ritual in their lives? Something is important. I know, who's got a ritual? They do. Besides the routines of daily life. Again, Jung rude the fact that we are a non-ritualistic culture, comparatively. We're not, I mean, most cultures, I mean, the way they get up in the morning, the way, the way they eat breakfast, the way they do everything. When I was at St. George Holmes, we had a lot. I mean, got my back to, we, have a, we had a lot of rituals. We would wake up in the morning, right? We're residential treatment center, Berkeley, California, right off of the US, UCB campus, it's the Berkeley campus. We sit on the ground in a circle, the staff, usually about six per shift or eight, depending. And we have, oh yes, a little bell, ding. And then we have a little, some little incense in the middle. I mean, very hippy dippy. And I looked kind of like I did in the Manson tape. So, I mean, it fits in perfectly. We're sitting there. We didn't chant, we would hold hands. And we would say a word that we would wish for the day, whatever. Courage, enlightenment, love, whatever, some concept, giggles. And then you pass the squeeze. That was the ritual every morning. We had a ritual in the afternoon and we had a ritual at night. And with the kids, all oh, they knew about the ritual. And they would do this, and it was very important to them who got to light the candles at the table. And, and the same thing, word before you go to sleep, pass the squeeze. Those were rituals. 
You had a, do you have a ritual or something? Please. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, really, but um, my father passed when I was 16. Yeah. And I, every time there's an important life marker, I'm not very artistic, but I use some, I create something that is a visual dedication to his presence at the event. Very well, but yes. The guy I told you about that almost got murdered last weekend, right? The guy with a lost and found dream? A friend of his came, the guy doesn't know all that well, and went crazy. Got drunk, went crazy, was about to butcher him with a knife and all the stuff he had to run. I mean, just huge. Didn't even go back to the guy. The guy stayed in his house for a couple of days. I mean, just, it was a very creepy thing. Very, I mean, it's just very creepy. So one of the things I also suggested, I said, hey, I'm no shaman and all that stuff, but Native Americans take sage and they kind of burn it and they kind of like clear the air, clear the vibe. He said, you know, this is really weird. You're the second person that mentioned that to me. One of my friends who was, happened to also be there said, you know, you ought to go in there and sage your place just to clear the energy. Because he said, I kind of walk in there and I kind of get creeped out still. I want my house to be my house again because I know he slept in this room and whatnot. That's a ritual. It's a cleansing ritual. So Duran Volcani, right, born in Israel, I'm not of Jewish faith, but I kind of have Jewish background with some Jewish rituals of sorts, like circumcision. Rory Devine, my wife, Irish Catholic, one of seven Catholic schools, the whole deal. Baptism, that's another ritual. She's not really religious, per se. She likes it as a ritual. She likes to go to church, though she's mad at the priest, so she won't go to the Catholic church anymore. But in any event, she likes that ritual. So he got circumcised, and he got circumcised, and he got baptized. I, I might have told you this, that her boss at the time said, you should have had the same day and invited everybody to a snip and dip. <laughs> Gotta love that. Well, the point of all this is, in terms of ritual, primal, primitive, surf gypsy guy, part of me, Jungian part, post-hippie, and he knows this. I took his foreskin. I know this looks weird. Look at that look. She's like, whoa, you are so weird. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, snippet of the a foreskin? Wait. I took his foreskin, and I waited. Remember, I got the privilege of being 38 seconds away from my favorite surf spot, South Bird. And I waited for a really low tide. One afternoon, paled it afternoon. And I walked to that reef, because it was low enough tide, I could walk to the reef. And I took his foreskin, and I planted it in that reef, and marked it for him. And he is the only surfer out there who can say, my wave, my foreskin's down there. My foreskin, my wave. A ritual. No, just Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and God's voice, the foreskin, they went. <laughs> Thank God this actually works. So I took it, it was low tide at South Bird, right in the reef there, the Ziggy's Reef, which is my favorite spot is South Bird, it's just a little reef that comes. And I planted his foreskin in his name, right there. So he's the only one that can say, my wave, my foreskin, my foreskin, my wave. And he knows this story. He thinks it's a little weird, but okay. <laughs> That's a ritual. Again, most of humanity right at this moment lives by very circumscribed, defined rituals. We have less direct rituals. So those of you who go to church and whatnot, or synagogue, whatever, those are rituals. Hand up, we're just moving. Yeah, my, um, my son has his own ritual. <laughs> and that would be... Um, he always wakes up for the first time, usually between 4 and 6 in the morning, and we'll sit in bed for about a half hour and just, you know, unstructured playtime and laugh. Wonderful. For a half hour, and then he'll go back and take a nap. Wonderful. Too. But without that time in the morning, he's usually cranky for the, half, for the first half of the day. Right. And, the, and that's wonderful. And rituals and routines, interestingly, intermingle, because that's a way. It's a way of routine, but it's deeper than that because it creates solace <laughs> and solidity. Rituals create solace and solidity, and they connect us to self, other, and the world. 
That's what ritual really does. It connects us to self love and I know a ritual every one of you participates in. And here comes your predictive mind. You already know. Happy birthday to, and of course you said you in your mind, because your mind already predicts. And every one of you, I hope, does something. Sorry? <laughs> well, that might be. Right, that's true. Unless you're Jehovah's Witness, good point. But most of us, and most cultures, celebrate something about your birth. For those of you who do, I think it's important you blow out a candle. Even if you're on your own somewhere, you light a candle, you make a wish, and you blow it out. It's a ritual. It's an honoring. It's called sacred time, when the calendar meets the archetypal, like a birthday. Are rituals different from traditions? I think traditions have rituals in them, embedded in them. I think tra rituals are the way traditions are carried out. And those are very, again, they connect us. They give meaning to life. Connection. Okay, so that's all part of how you listen to and integrate aspects of self. What do you like? What do you not so like about all of this? Please. I love that the answer is within you. Hmm. It is it's an interesting relationally based model, but the relationship is between you and yourself, between you and you. Therapist is a go guide. You've got to have a good alliance. But it's not like psychoanalytic or humanistic, where the relationship is so paramount the relation, the connection between you and I. I'm a guide. Yes? I like to focus on the balance, having your balance. Yeah. And just to add to that, I like how it's balanced between, it's very optimistic, I mean, your goal in life is to be all you can be, self-actualized in that sense. And yet, they totally acknowledge, if you want to say even honor, or know that you need to come to honor, the shadow, the dark side of humanity. They don't deny that. One of the criticism of humanism is it's kind of latita, jumping in the fields, we're all hugging. But then there's all this darkness. And Roger even said, you know, I don't manage anger really well. I don't have to deal with this anger thing. You know, it's very straightforward. The first thing you got to do in your process of therapy is confront your shadow. And first is really Siggy's unconscious, and that is the cauldron of seedy impulses. What humans would say, the disavowed self. Those aspects of self that you don't like about yourself. And so you have to push them away, that they're disavowed. They don't go away, you have to confront them, you have to face them. Face the inner angry one, the inner cruel one, the inner lazy one, whatever. So it's balanced in that sense also. What else? What's not so hot? I like that it's more of a guidance and not an interpretation of things. Yes. And you also do get to, as a, as a therapist, you do get to join the jam. Because one of the things I always like what you said about, well, in play, don't I get to play also? Because I do that, I being you in that moment. And yes, you do. You can join the narrative. And they will, and we'll, I'll give you a bunch of examples later. And they'll correct you. Just like the kid will say, no, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. Oh, okay, thank you for clarifying. So will the adult tell you this, that, and the other. They'll guide you. But you get to say, you know, I'm, I'm visualizing this. Don't know if that fits for you, but here's my... And if it works for them, that's great. You get to play too. Oh, oh, if it works for them, it's your piece, but I'll add rhythm and or a lead. Come on, something you don't like. Somebody, it's okay. Takes a while. Takes a while, absolutely, takes a while. This is not brief, and nothing wrong with brief cognitive behavioral therapy, God knows, empirically, evidence-based treatment. I don't know that, in fact, there's one. I don't. I don't know whether the unions have caught up with the whole evidence-based movement. I know the psychoanalytic folk have. They, they're, okay, okay, we'll listen, we'll do research. And they have, as you know. I think I sent you some of that when we were in the psychoanalytic. And it comes out really well, actually, psychodynamic. But it takes a while, no question about it. Evidence-based, question mark?
This, by the way, gets politically tricky. One of the factors, and, and when dear Ribner told me to rewrite my compendium for the class, my outline, course outline. As you see, my course outline is very, you know, you've got to be here by 8.25 or whatever it is, 8.30 or else this hang you know, I have to teach evidence. I, in one sense, theoretically, and maybe I, theoretically I shouldn't be teaching this because I have to teach evidence-based models. Wow. Not all, I, I don't know how evidence-based this model is or not. I, I haven't Googled that. I, I would assume by now there's probably some. But if you really cast out all the psychophilosophies that aren't specifically and rigorously evidence-based in terms of their treatment potential, I think you're doing a profound disservice to the field, to the public, and to you graduate students. But that's a whole other thing. But it's what's worth asking, evidence-based. Anything else? So a lot of people will say it's not practical. It's impractical. What I'm going to continue to try to do is show you that pragmatic Jungianism. How do we actually use this? And it is also true, even if I show you that, it's not necessarily for everybody like everything else. All this symbol stuff. Never mind, and we're going to drop a level at the end of the class today. It gets really, I mean really, wooga. Woga, yes, I haven't hit you with a technical term in a while. You're smart graduate students. This gets really wooga wooga, and I'm going to give you some wooga wooga examples at the end of the lecture today. Yeah. Wooga wooga. What does that mean? See how we can communicate in the right brain without the prefrontal cortex, and you know exactly what I mean. It's a great example of right brain communication. Can you explain severe pathology as in severe schizophrenia? Oh, absolutely. The biobasis of things. I mean, he's big on biobasis in terms of archetypes, see destined to bloom. But there's no question. I mean, come on. There is no question. There's significant epigenesis and otherwise biobased aspects to pathology, whether it's narcissism, God knows, sociopathic behavior. I mean, there's all kinds of neurobasis, though it interacts constantly with the environment. Um, I think, too, if it's not like properly, it, um, if the therapist was maybe not from a particular culture, it might be difficult to adapt it to a culture, because I know for like dreams mm. in different cultures, it can sometimes mean the opposite. So, um, I, and even though it says it's transpersonal and transcultural, mm -hmm. I, I think probably a multicultural emphasized therapist would say that well, it's really difficult to just superimpose this template onto every single and every culture. That's really well said. It's, so, it, because on the one hand, Jung really, in many ways, was the first, really was, the first psycho scholar who really looked at other cultures. I mean, he was fascinated by other, I mean, that's how this all derived for him. And as I said, I mean, he, he, would, he loved the Eastern culture. And read and read and read. We'd read in the original Greek and the original Latin. He studied Egyptian myth. I mean, so on the one hand, he was enormously trans. That, that's how transcultural. That's how this developed for him. How it's implemented within a transcultural world is a different question. And we implement in a westernized way. I'm a Western person. So that's a very good point. I think the theory is very much honors transculturalism. Yeah, I think if you were from a particular culture, you would be able to make the Correct. you know the alteration. But I think if you weren't from a, that culture and you were working from this perspective, it would be difficult. That's to a really good alter point. It. Yeah, it's again to me that's I, what I'm hearing in what you're saying, which is very important, is how we implement. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. We good? Are we there? We got a basis? Yeah, they're not for everyone. What it seems like for some people, it may be frustrating if they just want a simple solution to my problem. Oh, yeah. Like if you're causing the earth, forcing them or co guiding them to look at the symbols underlying it for PTSD, they'd be like, I don't care about the symbols, just tell me how to deal with these feelings. Mm -hmm. Correct. So that, that's a good segue to pragmatic eugenics of how we do that. So last time I told you about. And we're going to talk about um, imageries, and then we'll talk about dreams. That you can work in imagery with the with the, the 
personal imagery, basically of self to self. So I gave you, you know, you look, look at child you in front of your door, childhood door, right? And then put adult you there and then you relate. Okay. Now really, as much as it's so hokey and cliche, hug the inner child, I really encourage you to do that. I encourage you to see yourself at age five and talk to, put adult you in the scene with little five-year-old you and be kind, caring, value, validating. Be a psychoanthropologist of your own five-year-old. You have all these skills now of how to relate to little pumpkins in a value and validating way, right? how to connect, how to be bimonic with them. Do that with five-year-old you, because five-year-old you is still right there, as is one-year-old and two-year-old and eight-year-old and 12-year-old, and 82-year-old you is there. So see yourself at 9.25 a.m. on Thursday, 2040. I don't know what exactly the math is to how old you are. Okay? Actually, you know what? Let's bring it back. Let's make it 2025. What are you seeing? Where, what, what is she doing in that very moment? 925 on a Thursday morning. Working. Okay, perfect. Working. Where do you see her as you see her now? What setting? Mm, probably in her office. You see her in her office. Okay, standing, sitting. Sitting at the desk. Perfect. What kind of desk? A big, dark wood desk. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Put present you in that scene with future you. Okay, seeing yourself there? Mm -hmm. Perfect. What does she have to say to you? She might have some wisdom. It might be just trite and trivial. If it's okay with you, share with us what she says to you. Don't worry so much about the finances of things that it'll, that'll work out. Subtle, isn't it? <laughs> Hold on to that one. Beautiful. You have a guide within you. It's called future you. We could have taken you to even a much older you, but I thought, well, let's bring you to a professional because that's more immediately relevant for you. You have a guide within you, a very wise guide within you, future you. The point is you can see it like that. Again, I didn't have you tighten your toes, loosen your toes, close your eyes, do all that stuff. I just said, see future you. Now, you also notice in what I was talking, I'd get it more and more focused. So, see, and, and your first words were more um, kind of like you were seeing it. So I was seeing her. So I said, okay, what, give us a setting, the office. Oh, okay, perfect. It's standing or sitting. So I'm getting more and more detailed. And I'm giving you options that imply you're going to choose one or the other. So it implies you're going to get more specific. Mm -hmm. And then the desk. Great. What's the desk? I thought it was going to be this kind of wood, beautiful desk. You did that. We could, we could have said what you're dressing, what shoes. Get more and more and more and more and more, more detail. And make sure they're talking in the present tense as they're seeing her now. It's not I will be. Oh, right now I'm sitting at she is sitting at the desk. And I purposely want it not I'm sitting at the desk. No, you're not future you. You're here. You're you, you. That's future you. You create these various representations of aspects of self. As I said, it's great to do in couples therapy. Have them imagine their couple, their partner, at age three or eight or whatever. Them as adult, couple, the little one is their mate as a three-year-old. Their mate as an adult, them as a three-year-old. It says a lot about their relationship because we relate it's three-year-olds and eight-year-olds with each other. The two of you adults, the two of you as little, relating together. Okay, so these are all personal images. So we all have qualities, traits, attributes, right? Characteristics. You're a tradeologist. And we want to emphasize these. Well, you can personify them. You get an image of them. I had a stockbroker once, so here's the practical guy. He wants a solution. 
He was new. Working for one of the big firms. All right, the big stuff. What's the bane of their existence? Cold calling. Guy has to make, I don't know, 100 cold calls a day. No thank you, no thank you. Click, click. I mean, oh God, it's brutal. Doc, what do I do? I hate it. Well, if you're a tradeologist and you're a unionist and believe that all these different aspects of self are in there, you just need to find a representation, externalize the representation somehow, and it'll bring out that part of you. I said, so if you think about a great person on the phone, somebody who can do cold calls, who just sticks with it, what comes to mind? It happened that that time I was working with him, that's how long ago this was. By the way, I still see this guy now once every six weeks. It's wonderful. But that's how long it was. There was a movie called All the President's Men. Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman. Netflix it. It's about the Watergate crisis. And the Washington Post reporters who broke the story and all that. Well, Hoffman plays this character. This guy will not take no for an answer. He's on the phone. He is at it nine days. He's the one who said, okay, look, I need, I gotta have an answer. So here it is. I know you can't talk to me. I'm gonna count to ten. If you say one word, if you cough, sneeze, anything, make a sound, that means yes. If you say nothing, it means no. One. Two. Counts to three, but I think there wasn't a sound. Thank you. Click. I think I told you I used that once and I had to have a drug, I had to have the answer to a drug test. I said, did you ever see the movie? Yeah. I said, I'm not going to count to ten. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Thank you. That's what the guy said. Oh, okay. So that image, that's a great image. Do you have the book? He goes, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, if I remember the book right, it's a blue cover, and right on the cover is Hoffman and Redford running. He goes, yeah. Take the book to work. Put it right by your phone. Look at Hoffman. Make the call. He goes, cool. Pragmatic unionism. He did. Put the book. Made the calls. Look at Hoffman. He and her Hoffman. I can do that. Da, da, da. Comes back says, you know, it helped a lot. You know what helped even more? I hired an intern. Had them do it. <laughs> High five. It's another inner resource. The inner boss. Okay. I told you about this marvelous woman I worked with who was severely sexually abused over a long period of time by her dad. I told you that she adopted in her child her. I told you that she went through the court hearings in her mind, got CPS, all that stuff. Got her inner, the father arrested, all in her mind and all of that. Okay, so that's the person, the person of healing. She did that over many months. When it was her birthday, it happened to be her birthday day, I saw her. She did this whole thing with her child, took her to Disneyland, made her chocolate pancakes, all that stuff. Someday I'll give you my recipe for pancakes, you'll never forget it. It's the only thing I can cook really well. She felt very clunky. She was actually very feminine, very pretty lady, but she felt clunky, ogre. Nothing wrong with Olga. If anybody knows her, has an Olga. Nothing wrong with being called Olga. Sorry for the stereotype. God, you have to be so careful at all times. It's a mis It's a totally understandable misperception, and it bothered her. If it didn't bother her, fine. I, you know, it's not for me to say, oh, you should feel feminine. I, it really bothered her, and she felt particularly clunky at work. She worked in finance. Interesting. Two examples: financial people. She worked in finance. And particularly then, it was a very male-driven place. She went, I think she was the only woman in the office. All the more reason to feel clunky. But she didn't like that feeling. So what do I say to her? Oh, imagery-based therapists, union-esque, pragmatic therapists. What image personifies feminine? Exactly. So what do you see when you think of femininity? What comes to mind? She goes, oh. What do you think she said, by the way? I, ballerinas. I can't do ballet. Ballerina, I should do this. Then you really have no idea what I'm doing. I said, okay, cool. 
just an idea, totally up to you. If it feels right to you, take some representation, some picture, some something, photo. I mean, I know Picasso painted ballerinas. I know Degas painted ballerinas, you know, at the bar, that old deal. Take a picture to work. And put it right on your desk and you know, where you can see it and relate, relate to it. Eyes beam, she goes, I love it. Cool. And what did she take to work? I love this one. She, she came back and said, I did it, I did it. So which one? I, I don't know if you've ever seen this one. It's perfect because it's so subtle in a way. There's a poster, and she got a small version, of two very worn ballet slippers. And they're one crossing over the other. And that was perfect for her because it wasn't hyper girly and all of that because she didn't want to be hyper girly in that ambiance. But it was perfect. And so you bring out, you relate to that symbol. Okay? Anybody have their own kind of thing of this experience? Please. Um, I usually have like. I'm hearing something. My computers are talking. Oh, hi, computer. Okay. Nice computer. Have anything to add? The sharp right in. Tell me, sure, can't uh, Whenever there's a client that has like a really huge, like in a crisis house, um, a huge like hurdle or obstacle that they have to overcome, I have them do a story where they're um, a hero. Like, do exactly. Their hero exactly. Very good. I told you, when you take your orals, what part of you do I want up? Hero. You betcha. Very good, I like that. The inner hero. There you go. You're going to be very, do you have an image of an inner hero for you? Do you, or do you? Captain America. Captain America. Perfect. So perhaps maybe again, totally up to you. You'll find some way to bring Captain America. I mean, maybe a picture of him in your pocket, or maybe Captain America wears blue. I don't know what color. Red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. So maybe you have a red, white, and blue scarf. I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's something that's a concretization of Captain America that you have with you that kind of has a sense of wonderment and chuckleness about it. And you kind of go, hmm. So maybe it's red, white, and blue underwear. I don't know. It's just something. Sorry. But it's just, you know, but you get this? By the way, that's how humanity lives. That's what I'm saying. Most of humanity lives by symbols that are very conscious. It's not accidental. So we can start bringing that into our lives in a conscious kind of way. What about when people write things, like for instead of like an actual image, like if someone writes, like my girlfriend wrote on her mirror with her lipstick, you know, like a reminder for every day so that when she walks in there, it says like, whatever, you are beautiful, or like something. Yes, yes, yes. What do they call that? Uh, uh, not an aphorism. That's, uh, what is that? Affirmation. affirmation. Thank you. Hello. Close enough. An affirmation. Absolutely. So affirmations would be... Fantastic. Imagery. Absolutely. I'm, I'm focusing on imagery. You, you know about the three representational systems. I hear what you're saying. Those are people who are audio-oriented. I see what you mean visually. I, I, can, I can get a feel for that. Kinesthetic. Bender and Grindler were these guys, structure magic that came up with all that. That's also true. Some people are more auditory, more kinesthetic, but most all of us see. It's very primal. And if, we, and if it's a little cloudy, you can say, okay, start with the feet. Do you have shoes on or not? And, and they usually will. So we are very image based. But if somebody wants to write or have some other way of doing it, that's fantastic. This is a child psychotherapy class. I'm, I've been giving examples of adults. Why is this? Why, well, how do I bring this in with kids? Because kids so immediately, as you well know, live in the magic mind. They live archetypes. They believe in gnomes. They believe. They believe. They believe in the tooth fairy. They believe in Santa Claus up to a point. So it just doesn't make sense. You can get 25,000 miles around the Earth, 7 billion people. Some don't have chimneys. How does this work? Finally, the PFC. What? Magic. Magic. Yeah, but the prefrontal cortex eventually around age six, seven kicks in and goes, doesn't make sense. <laughs> Tooth fairy, they can buy a little longer sometimes because they see the money. Anyway. <laughs> they believe. So I had a little wonder who was scared. Anxiety disorder, among other things. And she does this, again, fast forward about three months of treatment, 
And she, oh God, I wish I had the picture. It's so wonderful. She drew her brave one. Brave girl. She called it brave girl. And it's just this beautiful drawing of this very spunky looking kid, full of light and colors and life. And so I took a picture of it and I emailed it to her mom, who printed it and put it right by her bed. Pragmatic unionism. You can also personify problems or states. Well, let's do the states one first. So I have this other client who, again, she's an adult, very vivacious, very gregarious, out in the world, will be the one who, you know, dance, appropriately dance on a table at a bar when, when it's appropriate. She's getting involved with somebody. She says, I don't understand what he sees in me. Because on the yum yuck continuum, way early on, right, early schemas of self, she feels extremely yucky. And what she actually said was, I feel like I'm this like field of flowers. I look really pretty up here. But underneath, it's just manure. I said, wow. And this is using, well, I said, you know, that's weird. Because what I'm seeing right now is I see the flowers. If you put manure, I don't know, I just see it kind of as dirt. Flowers need, you know, we gotta have roots, gotta have some dirt. But then I see this tunnel that goes down. And actually, I'm seeing this incredible gold mine. And she looks at me and goes, no, no, it's rubies. And I went, yes, perfect. And that's what he's discovering. He knows that underneath it all, never mind you're a beautiful field of flowers, you're a ruby mind. You're a mind of Fast forward two years, she marries a guy. What do you think's on her wedding ring? Thank you. Well, not thank me, thank her. <laughs> Pragmatic unionism. It's a narrative, it's a co-narrative. Bimonic in a different way. You get to use your magic mind. You've got it, you're an archetype, you live archetypes. That's the whole beauty and point of all this. We're all one species. We all share this, yes. One. Good. I, I was just thinking, my mother in law gave me a ring that she got, and I don't have it right now because he broke, but that she got from my father in law um, when they had their 40th um, anniversary. And, you know, with so much divorce and everything, and, you know, everyone has their personal history, you know. So I thought, you know, this represents 40 years of good marriage, you and I'm going to get there. So I always worry to remind me of that. And it broke, so I have to fix it. But to me, it's very important to have it in my finger. Absolutely. Because it's a reminder every day of how to keep it going. Absolutely. We use objects again as symbols to personify important, important things. I mean, the whole thing of, you know, well, God forbid if your house went on fire, what would you save? Most people say they're photographs, because now it's all in the cloud. So we don't have to worry just as long as the cloud isn't set on fire. But they'll grab, what's a, a song way before your time? Tell Laura I love her. Oh, I want to go to heaven because she died. She, she goes, you know, it's a silly song. <laughs> Actually, Harrison did another version of it. Where she goes back to the car stuck on the railroad track. She goes back to get their teenage ring, going steady ring. And of course, she gets killed. So I have to be good so I can go to heaven to be with her. Anyway, we get very attached to things that represent important things. So problems. The most depressed kid I ever worked with, teenager, inpatient, County Mental Health, San Diego County Mental Health, when I did my postdoc. He would just literally stand, kind of almost vulture-like, in the hallways, and kind of descend on anybody who walked by and just go, I'm so lost, I'm so lost, I'm so lost. Actually, interesting, lost and found yesterday. And people would kind of wish he'd get lost, because they didn't know what to do with him. He got a little better. He got um, back to his out, out of the hospital life, and I saw him. And in, in individual outpatient therapy, he's the one I tell you where I almost fell asleep. Did I ever tell you this? One little, little tangential, but relevant, because we all do these things. 
He literally talked like this. I literally talked like that. I'm not exaggerating. It's a very depressed individual. I cared about this guy. I mean, we did connect. Going to local high school, I saw him. At that point, my office was on Nautilus Street in this building that put that towards the ocean, and it was a late afternoon, and the sun was beaming in, kind of like a Rembrandt painting. You could kind of see the dust, and he's silhouetted there, and I'm sitting here, and he's talking like this. And all I remember is I'm somewhere else, and I'm suddenly realizing by the intonation of his voice that he's asking me a question, so I'm going to have to respond. And all I remember is I'm kind of like, come up, come up, come on, conscious mind. I didn't know so much PFC in those days, that language, but it's that idea, come, PFC, come up. And I looked at him and I said, and this is pre-Google, you might want to look that up in the yellow pages. And by the time I got to pages, actually yellow pages, I totally understood the situation that I had no idea what he'd asked me. I knew he asked me something, I had no idea, and I, I came up with that answer to whatever it is he asked. And he looks at me, and I copped out. I said, metaphorically speaking. He went, oh, okay, yellow pages. Yeah, you have resources, you have resources. Anyway, this guy, did say, and if you listen to people, you're, they're talking in metaphors all the time. This guy did say, you know, I feel like I'm in a maze. And of course, you immediately say, that's amazing. And then you go, wait a sec. Give me the visual. What's the maze? What's it look like? He goes, well, I don't know. I'm like, like there's walls. And there's like a path, and I, but I don't know how to get out. And then, guided, co-guide, I go, you know, I don't know if it's on your left or your right. You always want to give a choice. You've got to feel in control. But I'm thinking there's maybe like a door there or something. Yeah, yeah, door. Fantastic. Door handle? Yeah, dark metal door handle. Fantastic. As, as you open that door, right, this is a suggestion, tell me what you see if it's okay with you. I always have permission. More maze. Okay, okay. I don't know if it's steps, ladders, something. What is it that's like on the wall so that you can be on top of the wall, so you can look out? Oh, yeah, it's a rope ladder. He looks up. What does he see? More maze. Okay, well, how far? Oh, I do see San Diego. Okay, good. I'm hearing it. I'm fast forwarding. I'm hearing in the distance, a ha it's a sound. It's like, because, yeah, a helicopter. Yes, a helicopter. I'm going to get him out of this maze. We together, your non-conscious mind, and I, we're going to do this. We're going to get you out of this maze, metaphorically speaking. Helicopter comes. Helicopter picks him up, takes him. Where is it? Where is it going? Takes him to his room. Now, I want to know who the helicopter driver is. Anytime you have a healing, helping figure, you want to know who it is. Who was it? His mother. Interesting. So your mom has ways of helping you out of this maze. Let's figure out how to use her. Another person comes and says, God, I feel like I'm drowning. This was a woman. I say, whoa. Give me the image. Where are you drowning? What do you mean? How are you seeing? I mean, a lake, ocean, river, what is it? It's, just, uh, it's an ocean. OK. Night, day, tell me more. It's at night, and I'm drowning. I'm, I'm alone. I'm out there. And I say, and again, this is guided. I'm a co-guide. I don't know what it is. So my sense is something is going to come to help you. And when it does, please let me know. If it's okay with you. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to give you the content. But, but I am going to guide you and say something's going to help you here. And if not, we'll deal with that. We'll go underwater, but we'll figure this out. I see a boat. Oh, okay. There's a boat here. Yeah. Bunch of people. And they see me, the big spotlight, they see me, I'm going, help, help, help. And they toss over one of those life preservers, those circle ones, you know, the red stripe is really old. And she puts it on and gets on board. She's saved. Okay? So if you're going to bring the symbol out into the world, what do I say to suggest to her next? 
You know, I know this sounds really silly, but if it makes any sense to you, after you leave here, there's a Speedy Mart right down that street. I bet they have a pack of Lifesavers. If it makes any sense to you, buy a pack of Lifesavers and put it in your purse. Carry it with you. Hokey, yes. She liked it. She did that. I also said, and by the way, do you ever see a little silver Lifesaver? Because it's kind of an archetypal symbol. Like for charm bracelet or for a necklace or something. If it makes any sense to you. Or sometimes you'll see them on a blouse. Buy it. Wear it. Pragmatic unionism. If the person buys it, if that fits for them. Okay? Getting a sense of this? Okay. Okay, I'm tired. Have this guy come to me. I've seen his child. Actually, his foster child. No, I take it back. I saw his son. I saw his son. This guy's a military guy. Has a perfectly coiffed mustache. His face is kind of like a falcon or a hawk. Rather stern, but straightforward. You know exactly where he stands. Calls me and says, I know you have to report this. By the way, I've reported it myself. I have abused by hitting my foster son. And my foster son rightfully is being removed. And I don't want to do this ever again. I, I want to know why I'm doing this, and I want to never do this again. I said, wow, you are a brave man. Come on in. I'd stopped seeing his son a while ago. He had the most remarkable ability to move into imagery states. Unbelievable ability. And he would spend the entire, in those days, 15-minute session, imagining child him, healing child him, all this other stuff. He once talked about having a broken heart. The day he talked about it, I happened to have cut my finger. Actually, I still have the scar a little bit. I was in a hurry to get to work. So I know this sounds crazy, but I put a little crazy glue on it, because I know it binds skin just to hold it. It worked. I went, oh, that's interesting. Probably contaminating myself, but that's OK. I got it. And I had a little bandage. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a little cut. I used crazy glue, but it seems to be holding. He tells me about his broken heart. If you're an imagery-based therapist in that moment, what do you suggest we do? You've got to heal it. We've got to do open heart surgery, and we've got to heal that broken heart. So that's exactly what he did. And he had surgeons there and blah, blah, blah. And yes, he said, oh, he started chuckling. I said, what do you see? The surgeon's got this huge tube of crazy glue, and he's using it to bind my heart. And then he had his family come in in his mind with a recuperation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. He also carried a lot of garbage. Yes, his term. I carry a lot of garbage about my mom, my dad, my brother. So what do we do? Of course. You got to dump. You got to go to the dump with the garbage. I know this sounds so like trite. It isn't when you're actually doing it. Trust me. If, it, if it's meaningful, if it affects to you. And he had separate big bags. He had big bags for mom. And he labeled it. You know those black bags only had white tape on it. Mom. <laughs> Dad less, brother less. And he wanted himself. He didn't want, I said, I imagined, again, I imagined the trash collector comes. So I said, he says, no, 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 I'm dumping it. I'm going to rent a big dump car thing, truck. And he sees himself, and he had to do it. He had to go back and forth to the uh, dump place. It's very real in the moment. Speaking of that, I sent you an article about avatars. Do you know that when you think about yourself, certain areas of the brain light up, and when you think about an avatar that represents yourself, same areas of the brain light up. That's called direct identification with an image. And it works the same if you don't externally see the avatar, but internally visualize the avatar. I told you, you could give yourself the childhood you never had by imagining it. Imagery is neurobiologically real because reality is in here. It's one of the things that play teaches us, that reality really is self-created. We create it. So he got rid of a lot of garbage. He healed his heart. 
Now, I don't have the evidence-based research follow-up study with him to say he really significantly changed out in the world, but I bet he did. Please. I do use a lot of a lot of things with myself, and I haven't done it for years because walking, I guess I have a good imagination. But um, and I use it with my kids a lot. Yes. But like like moments in my life when I have lots of stress, sometimes I imagine putting whatever it is that is causing that stress, like in a box. Yes. And take it to the ocean, and the ocean takes exactly. it away. And, and it feels better because then I just see it. I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, the ocean is so big. So, so I do use it a lot for different things. And actually, years ago, I wanted to do um, like my research for um, the research for the dissertation with imagery because I thought, like, let's say people with anxiety, if they can, like, when they're in a state of anxiety, they mm -hmm. can imagine. But that was my theory. Mm -hmm. Now it's making a little bit more sense, but still I don't know what Understand. Out, it's out there. But like if they can imagine themselves doing something when they're in a state like that, I wonder if that could uh, lower their anxiety because then they have more control of it by looking at their self, themselves doing whatever it is that will release some of that. Understand. So, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the there's a lot of work obviously in this area. There's, oh God, it gets, there's a guy named Symington who created the Symington Institute because one of his patients had cancer, inoperable cancer. And the imagery that they came up with was white wolves eating hamburger, rotting hamburger. And the white wolves represented the white blood cells. And the rotting hamburger was the cancer. And at least in that case, lo and behold, the tumor actually went away. It doesn't always work. But he has a whole institute where he uses imagery to fight cancer. And now he also has those close to that person do the same imagery. So you can use it in a lot, a lot of different ways. As you well know, one of my really fundamental ways of being in the world doing therapy with kids and adults is aspects of self-represented by all these little members of the inner cabinet, right? The Oval Office or the soccer team. Sometimes kids will say, you have all these different people on your soccer team and some of them are angry and some, and how do we relate to them? And the person who is the president that's able to say, okay, I've got my angry one, I've got my protected one, that is the self that's able to see beyond any one aspect of self and utilize aspects because every part of the self is useful at times. And having that image in of itself be very useful, powering. Okay, so I've given you problems. Okay. I want you to imagine a boat. A boat. And as you imagine the boat, just kind of see it fully. What time of day is it? Where is it? What kind of boat? Okay, come back. Unless you want to keep sailing away. There are transpersonal images that you can request that the client evoke. Who's willing to share their boat? Okay, boat. What do you see? Uh, what are you seeing? Do it present tense as you're seeing it now. So I'm your boat. Seeing a navy ship. Okay. It's a frigate. It's off the coast of Hawaii. It's daytime. Okay. The water is very, very blue and okay. uh, very, very calm. Okay. Are you on the boat? Yes. Where? On the flight deck. Okay. Perfect. Boat. Ship, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big boat, but it's just big enough, and I'm sitting in the very front part of it, and I'm not moving in the dock, and I have a drink in my hand and watching the sunlight. <laughs> and how do you feel? How do you feel? Awesome. Very cool. Anybody else? Boat, ship, something? Right. What'd you see? <laughs> uh, on a cruise ship? You're on a cruise ship. Okay. It's actually a past experience. So okay. Really you get to use past experience. Imagine. Okay. <clears throat> Boats are transpersonal symbols. So you get to have your own little 
personal version of a transpersonal symbol. Here's a more ar classically archetypal transpersonal symbol. I want, oh God, she got nervous all of a sudden. I could see that. You can always say, no, you're my boss. But I know your courageous one that's inside of you is willing to do this. So you're walking down a road, okay? As you're seeing yourself walk down a road, what, just describe quickly the road as you see it. Where, what's the setting? Maybe it's a forest, maybe it's a beach, maybe it's a mountain, where, what do you see? Beach, you're walking on a beach. Okay, guide it, I'm gonna guide this. I don't know if it's to your right, to your left, where it is, but there's this little, like a hut. And you have a sense that in that hut lives an old lady. And this lady has lived a life. An old lady who has lived a life in a hut on this beach where she is walking. <clears throat> And something draws you to this hut. And you, a little trepidation, but nonetheless, are knocking on that door. She comes to the door and opens it and greets you and welcomes you inside. And you feel a certain almost mythic, mystic sense of you're in the presence of somebody that's very special and very wise. So you see yourself walking in. What's the inside of the hut like? Cozy. Okay. You standing, sitting? Is she offering you something? Standing. Okay. I think I'm getting. I'm just oh, you're gonna stand right there. Okay, that's good. That's very good. Very good. Just at the, at the door. Okay. If we had the time, I'd take you through it, but we don't have the time. She does communicate something important to you. If it's okay with you. What is it that she communicates to you? Things gonna be okay. 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 How did she communicate that to you? I mean, she tell you that or? Tell me that. Okay. Okay. Things are gonna be okay. Okay. We all have an inner wise one, right? That's one of the archetypes. We talked about some of the archetypes. We talked about the mom archetype. We talked about the father archetype. We talked about archetypes have a positive side, the nurturing mom, ooh, the evil Disneyland mom, dad, huh? the wise one, the old man, the old woman, very important archetype. Obviously, we talked about the hero. Obviously, we talked about shadow. <sighs> Another great famous archetype for the shadow, of course, the most famous four notes in history. Not da 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 dum. I think that's five notes. Dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. Honk, honk, honk. <laughs> it's archetype for the shadow. Underneath this ocean of stuff, unconscious, non conscious comes this. I will tell you this you dream of a child, you're having an important dream. I won't tell you what it means because I don't know what it means, but I'll tell you it's important. And I'll tell you that child needs to be well taken care of. And we talked about the hero and how important the hero is. We talked about who knows archetypes really well? Disney, Lucas, that old industry. The advertising industry knows it real well. And you know the other industry knows archetypes incredibly well called the gaming industry. Oh my God, I told you, wow, World of Warcraft is the crack cocaine of video games. It's unbelievable. It hits our need to connect because you're connecting with all kinds of people out there from China and anywhere else, and needs to be competent. Oh my God, you're soaring over buildings. You're doing things you could never do in the real world. And yet you believe it. If you read that Avatar article, you neurobiologically you believe you're actually doing this stuff. You get very attached to the creature you created, and you get to be a hero like you've never gotten to be. In an archetypal sense, these are all very archetypal images. Oh my God, mainlining. It's unbelievable how it hooks us. You become somebody you could never be in the real world. <sighs> it's a hard addiction to give up. Okay. Let me just get out a piece of paper, please. I'm going to take a break in a moment. And I want you to divide it into a quadrant. We're going to change. We're going to go into dreams. 
And now I'm going to take a break. Quadrant. So you divide up into four pieces like this. You do the line like this, line like that. Here's a piece of paper. Okay, so one way to look at dreams is that it has a beginning. Yeah, you're walking through the, you know, in the park or whatever. Okay, it has a little beginning. Then it has a kind of like, huh. These are kind of disturbing dreams, by the way. Kind of like, uh, I don't know. Like, oh, I think I might be hearing footsteps. Use that cliche. And then, oh my God, it's chasing me and I can't move. Okay, so one way to divide up a dream is it has a beginning. It's just kind of neutral or whatever. This is a difficult dream. This is a problem. Entry. Then it has like a mid part where like, uh oh, something's not going to go so well. And then like, oh my God, oh no. And then you wake up. I would like you to think of some dream. I can't remember any. Great, then make it up. <laughs> Just make it up. It's the same thing, by the way. And it, that has some unresolution. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a repeating dream from childhood. Maybe it's a childhood dream. I don't care. And I want you to represent it in the three quadrants. I don't care whether it's a little stick figure drawing, or it's just a symbol, or it's some words. The beginning, the, okay, things are getting a little more interesting, and the, oh, holy schmurgle Troy. Another technical term. Holy schmurgle Troy, oh no, now what? Okay, and just represent it. And when you're done, just go ahead and leave. You don't put your name on anything. Just leave the sheet there on your desk. You don't turn it in. And you can go take a break. And please come back. I know I'm not giving you much of a break, but we have a lot of stuff to cover. And you get to not have to come on finals week. So we have a lot to cover. So please come back a quarter after. I know that's hard. So we're supposed to make a story? Yes. Beginning, kind of middle, and then end for a dr drama dream. Hey, oh my God, dream. Or something that was a little unsettling. Of a dream? Yeah. Okay. And if you can't think of one, then make up a dream. So the unsettling part is the third? Yeah, unsettled. Oh no! Ah! Ah! Ta da! Ta da! No. If you can't think of any, just make it up. I guess I can turn these, well, I'll wait. No, you can take a break after that. I can turn this off for now. Okay, we're back. One other little thing before we get to dreams. Throughout humanity, totem animals have been a really important part of most cultures. So I was going to, I lived in Berkeley when I was at St. George Holmes. And I went down to surf at Santa Cruz. And it was this huge stormy sea. Huge waves. I'd just been through a bunch of traffic, by the way. A big hassle to get there. Kind of a journey myth. Long and winding road, but lots of traffic. Before I kept a guitar in my car. Traffic jam. I get there. I look over the cliff. And there's this incredibly turbulent water because there's like this pillared rock sticking out of the water about 15 feet off ashore. And in the middle of all of this is uh, 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 a seal. My first thought was, oh, poor sealy pumpkin. He's caught in the middle of this raging sea. And then I realized, oh, wait, no, he's going out, or she, and then choosing to come back in. This is play. This is a good time. Like, oh, 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 big Ooh, yeah. Never forget it. Never forget the image in my right. I thought, oh my God, I was just fetching in the middle of traffic and rah, rah, rah. and here's a seal purposely putting themselves in what I thought was ultimate chaos and cacophony and getting a chuckle out of it. Henceforth, my totem animal, the seal. So I have little seals at home. I have little stuff seal in my office. I've got little statuettes of seals. It's my totem animal. I love when I see a seal. Uh, uh, uh. You have a totem animal? What's your totem animal? Uh, it's a lamb. A lamb? 
Perfect. Do you have a lamb? Some kind of a. Oh yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Would you share? This isn't totem animal. This is back. Will you share what you shared with me in the break? Oh, eBay. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I was doing some inner child work with, in therapy, and uh, I went. She told me it would be a good idea to find a representation of myself as a child. So I went on eBay and I found this baby doll with the brown curly hair and the whole thing. And um, I bid on her, and then I ended up getting to a bidding war for her. <laughs> and I ended up fighting for her and winning her, and um, she now sits in my office. And she's a very good representation nice. of me. Very nice. <laughs> I would encourage any of you and all of you, and we can do this with your clients, both little and large, baby photos, photos of yourself or their client as a child, and put it someplace and talk to that photo. Be nice. Kind, loving, caring, info, say, resonating, value, and validating, psychoanthropologist of child in photo. Okay? It's very powerful. And you can have your client bring in a photo of them when they were young. It's very powerful. There's okay. a photo of me and my parents' refrigerator. Um, we're currently on speaker painting. Uh huh. And I used to have um, naturally blonde hair back then. And um, so I have finger paint all over my body, and I'm just thinking like. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. You spirited, spunky. Fabulously creative inner child. I have a, I have a marvelous 12-year-old. The client's bringing him to me because he's overly responsible. If he could only get an A minus instead of all A's, they would be thrilled. That would be his task. Oh, no, it's really reversed. So one of the other things, so we've talked, we talked about what part of him is playful, blah, blah. Mom said, you know, I have this great picture of him, very similar to what you're describing. He's, I think he's about 10, 15 months old, something, a little over a year. And he's with puddings. And he's smearing the puddings, and he's just got this gleeful look. So I, because I use an iPad a lot, as you know, I took a picture of that. So he knows I have that, and we'll use that. And I show him that as his inner, fabulous, free-spirited child. Really important. OK, so there's this woman named Margaret Cartwright. And here's what she did. She got a bunch of women who had at least six months' worth of depression beyond blues, beyond glum, who also happened to have a recurring dream that was disturbing to them. OK? All right, so she brings them in. It's a, it's a sleep research lab. So they spend the night. They've got them all rammed up, right? They've got the electrodes and whatnot. And sure enough, they're looking. Here comes the ram. They're waking them up. What happened? They had the same dream again. There we go again. All right, go back to sleep. Can you imagine the insomniacs that sit there and do dream research and watch people all night long sleeping? Envious? <laughs> Weird, but anyway. Ram, wake up, dream. You know, and everybody in this room could learn this, what I'd like you to do next time you start having that dream is move your finger, either right or left. When you tell somebody to do something, you usually give them a choice. It's the illusion of choice. They don't have a choice whether to do this, but they have a choice whether to do this. You notice a lot of the guided imageries, they give you a choice. Left side, right side, is a beach, that. What I don't give you a choice about is whether you're on this journey, and whether there's a hut or whatever it is. So sure enough, here comes Ram. Look, yep, there's a little finger. Up, oh, wake up. Oh, OK, same dream. Now, let's create a dream. What happens? Let's do a group dream. Let's start out. What's the first scene? No, so, not your dream, oh. dear, dear one. Just a make up a dream, any dream. Just a make up one. Just a beginning. Um, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot <laughs> terribly. Feel. feel the flowers. Perfect. Next. So there's a field of flowers. Sunny day. It's a sunny day with a field of flowers. We're going to have to keep this moving to some place where it doesn't keep being sunny or something. It's good. <laughs> I'm liking this. Somebody's there, you're there, you want to be there? There's, yeah, lots of there. uh, butterflies. Butterflies! Okay. Well, it's still sunny. Still sunny, and there's butterflies. We need a little more shadow, people. We've got a lot of light here, it's good. Then? You see smoke in the distance. Ah, uh, aha! Uh, there is smoke in the distance. Smoke on the. That's a different song. <laughs> Go ahead. Then? Uh, the smoke's getting closer. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Smoke's getting so you can even hear the crackling of the burning. And? People kind of get away. 
People are panicking, starting to panic. They're running. They're starting to run. They're starting to run. Should we wake up then? Is this good enough or do we want to add an element? No, you're not running fast enough. You're not running fast enough. The flames are getting close. You can feel the heat. <laughs> what? Oh my God, somebody's falling down. Oh no. The dilemma, the ethical moral dilemma, empathy and fairness. Do you pick them up or not? Oh my God. Thank God you wake up. Wait, you're going to add something. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, this is getting worse and worse. This might be getting too dark. I think we'll leave it there. Okay, so we got this. You're in this lovely field. It's a beautiful field. It's sunny. There's lots of butterflies. And then all of a sudden, you start noticing smoke. Who did the smoke? In the distance. The bed's in the distance. Uh oh, smoke's getting closer. I'm starting to hear it. Crack, I can smell it. Oh my God, there's a bunch of people. We're starting to run. Oh no, somebody's falling. Oh no, did you pick them up or not? Or You're starting to scream. For what was the other element? Is that it? Fell. Yeah, we got the person fall. <gasps> Thank God you woke up. <sighs> I need a glass of water after this. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so what Cartwright did, let's imagine this is a repeating dream. Every night you have the dang dream. Here we go again. Oh, man. She says, you know, this is in the waking state now. Let's create a solution. To this dream. Let's, let's, let's come up with a good outcome. A new ending. An ending. So what do we do? Let's come up with an ending. We hear a thunderstorm. Ah. We're hearing a thunderstorm. And? It starts raining. It starts raining. Okay. And? Fire. Put the fire out. Okay. Okay. Okay, good, good. Thunderstorm, raining, shh, fire's out. And then what? We've got all these people. We've got the person down. Any, anything else more? Firefighters We get some firefighters in there. <laughs> what one? <Hi. laughs> yeah, the ones that have the calendar, the ones that are on the calendar ones. Yeah, those. Okay. Yeah, great. My wife. Now it's going. Now it's going. To, now the fire takes on a different meaning. Now I think we're more in Siggy's territory. Yeah. Less Jungian, more Freudian here. Oh yeah, hot fire. Ooh, help me. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, you big Bruno guy. Anyway, all right. So we, but we can put in some fire guys. They might as well be out with or fire gals. I don't care. You know. People are helping each other up. People are helping each other up. Okay, okay. I'll add my, I, I'm seeing them do like a dance almost together. <laughs> hey, why not? It's getting sunny again. The fire's been put out. Yes, please. You get your voice back. Because we're singing. Not only down, da, 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 we're singing. <laughs> <laughs> anything else? We, we covered it? We feeling better? Melissa, you have if you want anything, anything you want to add? I, no, I don't have good dreams. I can't okay. think of something. That's fine. We're good. We're, that's all right. I think, I, think that's, I think that's enough. So, fire on, oh my God. Whew, distant, thunder, rain. Ah, wow, put out the fire. Then we must have the thunderstorm break up. It's now sunny again. Butterflies can come back and whatnot. We pick up the person. Oh, voice is back. We're dancing. The hotties come. They all put out a little bit of the fire so they feel useful in some way. They come back. They join the dance. You get to dance with them. Okay, perfect. Now, the really interesting part comes. That very night in the research lab, the person goes back to, oh, oh, I left out such an important part. Oh. Rewind. So we had the fire, so we had the thunderstorm, blah, blah, blah. While the person is coming up with a solution and finds a solution and ends it, so we're all dancing and singing. What happens? Ding. Oh my God, yes, they actually ring a bell. The researcher rings a bell. Ding. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Pavlov. Ding. So you know where this is going. You know exactly where this is going. You brilliant interventionists. You evidence-based research interventionists <laughs> with heart. That night, sleeping. REM, signaling. Burning fire is coming. What happens next? Thank you very much. Ding! Rem continues. Person seems happy. Wake up. 
<gasps> I dreamed the fire came and then the thunderstorm and then the blah, 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 the hotties and then the dancing and ah, I feel so much better. And lo and behold, their depression significantly decreased. Now, God knows intervening variables up the yin yang. I don't think there even was a control study. Would never pass muster in this school, no siree. Margaret Cartwright wouldn't be able to get her PhD on that piece of research here, because we're social scientists. Keyword, scientist. She's done a lot of research since then. That is called lucid dreaming. You get to change your dream. You get to apply consciousness to unconscious dreams. So when we were at St. George Home, when kids have bad dreams. I was a head resident, I ran a home. I had three lovely girls in the, below me. My floor was their ceiling, okay? They would have bad dreams. We had a broom. They could dunk, dunk, dunk on their ceiling, my floor, and I'd come down. We'll call her, Melinda, we'll call her Linda. Linda had a dream once where her arm was bitten by a big monster. Uh, I come down, I'm a big monster in my arm. She's not psychotic, she knows not. I say, what do we need to do to take care of it? She gives the perfect two point response on the whisk. What is it, five now? I don't know. Well, we gotta wash it off. And we gotta put some antiseptic ointment. We gotta put a bandage on it. That's exactly what we're doing. And the next day, when she went to the therapeutic school, because we were a dream culture, and she has a Band-Aid on all that, and they, what's wrong? She said, well, a monster bit my arm, but I took care of it. Oh, cool. Everybody understood. Because every morning, in terms of rituals, we would have a dream circle. And the kids would come up and share a dream and be given a dream task to do. Okay? Seno Indians. In your compendium, there's an article about the Seno Indians. Actually, I think it's written by Stefan, who was at, at St. George Holmes. They were a dream culture. Now, of course, while everybody else in Malaysia, while everybody else was mean and nasty and ate each other, these guys were gals, were peaceful, loving, wonderful. And they would actualize their dreams. So if they dreamed that they were nasty to their neighbor, and the next day they'd say, I'm really sorry, I was nasty to you in my dream, so I baked you a wonderful pie here, enjoy. If a monster was coming after them, they'd turn around and say, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you want? Because you're bugging me. Stop. In fact, I want a gift from you because you're bugging me. We need to make an amends. Teach me a dance. Taught a dance. That day, to tell the tribe, had a monster to teach me a dance. Let me teach the tribe to dance. Okay. You're falling off the cliff. Oh, no. I think it's time for some wings. Thank you. Woo! Fly high. Okay? You can do that. You can learn to change your dreams while you're dreaming it makes a difference. This very same client that I told you about who just about got murdered last weekend, about I don't know, three months ago, six months ago, something came to me. He said, you know, Doc, I had this dream with a big T-Rex came to get me. Freaked me out. So I had him talk to the T-Rex. And they actually, that's another thing. You have a dark figure, talk to that figure. Write it out or some other way. Confront the figure. Well, actually, the figure was hungry, so they ended up feeding him, became more of a pet. And what did he go, what I suggest he go do? What did I suggest he go do in the outer world? Absolutely, go to your nearest toy store and go buy a T-Rex. Thank you very much. And he does, he did. And to this day, he still has it by his bed, little, little T-Rex, his little buddy, Rexy. Hey, Rexy. If you want to buy a calendar of hotties, firefighters, all yours. Go marry a firefighter. Or Whatever. I had a dream once. Again, I was at St. George Holmes. My two poor girlfriend at the time, Marsh, had to deal with all my psychic content all over the walls on my side. I was looking for Donna Remy. Donna Remy was this girl I had a huge crush on in high school. And we finally dated my senior year. <sighs> I'm in the city. I'm looking for Donna. By the way, anybody ever tells you a dream, have them tell it in the present tense as they're being it now. The client tells you, have them tell it in the present tense. OK? 
kid, present tense. Kids are fabulous at this. They love having dream heroes you can put in whoever you want in there, Superman, etc. So I'm in the city. I'm looking for Donna. I'm looking for Donna. Great anima dream. All of a sudden, and this is live action, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this ginormous cartoon animated green, British Ration green, giraffe. And he, this, he says, she is right over there. Smile. I'm like, thanks, my guide. So what do I do as a green task? Because I couldn't find a big green giraffe. I took a piece of paper almost the size of this board. I am no artist, but somehow, man, I channeled the green giraffe. And I had this incredible drawing of this green giraffe with this, like, she's right over there. I'm your guide. With perfect British racing green. It used to be on Porsches. And I put it on my wall right above, on the ceiling, not the wall, on my ceiling right above where I slept. So every night I could see the, my guide, the green giraffe. Okay? It's a dream task. Let me give you a more somber one. Or, I don't know, somber, but more moving in a way. So I've told you about this marvelous woman who was Melissa of the Child and whatnot. She did a lot of inner child work. Ballerina, inner feminine. She would have a recurring dream. And the recurring dream, and it just horrified her, is she's on a beach, walking on a beach. And of course, the water starts to suddenly suck out. And the horizon disappears and blackens. And this huge tidal wave comes at her and drowns her. And, she, and it happens over and over again. She, and she's had this dream for years. And then she remembers, she did say, and this is symbol to sign, or at least one aspect of the symbol. She remembers her dad would ho take, get her naked and then hose her down with water. And how, this, how ashamed and disgusted she felt. And how, so she had that. Side. And then she weepingly says, he drowned my spirit. That's what I hate him for most. He drowned my spirit. And I said to her, because the real, real reality, again, we, have, we live false truths about ourselves. Not true. It's not true. She's an her experience is true. I never take away somebody's experience. But it's also true, she's a fantastically spirited individual. I mean, she really is. And I said to her, you know, that's really interesting. Spirit is of air. Water can never drown air. That's all I said. She comes back the following week, has the following dream. I'm on the shoreline. The water sucks out. I gain that feeling, that terrible, dark, scary feeling. I look on the horizon, and the huge tidal wave starts coming in. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. And all of a sudden, I'm in a bubble of air. And the water comes over me, and I float right through it, above it, and I look down as it goes past. And I'm in my bubble of air. Co-narrative transformative. Get some bubbles. Pop your troubles. Okay? Pragmatic unionism. If the person's inclined and willing to do that stuff. For Jung, every dream not addressed, not related to, is like a letter left unwritten. Unread, I'm sorry. Letter left unread. They're messages. The good news is they'll keep sending the stuff. It's not, it's not junk mail. If it's important mail, they'll send it again. Hey, like I was saying the other night, hello. In fact, that's what recurring dreams are. Hello. Need to still work on this. OK? OK. <clears throat> Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions. Are we, got, are we OK in this? You have some sense? So who's willing to share their dream? You want to share? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Talk to us. Um, I had this dream like several 
times and I so I remember I'm always like usually outside shopping mall or inside the building and the next thing I'm inside the train or train station trying to get somewhere maybe I'm thinking home and then at the end um, I always get lost and I, I can't go home um, I okay. feel partly um, scared but okay. um, at the same time still enjoying like being at the train station too. okay okay what am I going to have you guys do? Gals do. Women. Whatever you call each other now. Yeah. What am I going to have you do? In the fourth quadrant. Mm -hmm. Say it loud. Yeah. Exactly. So what you do in the fourth quadrant, right here, high PFS, it's a dialogue. It's a balance between the PFS and the horrible frontal metaphoric magic mind. So create a solution. It's a wonderful song. Can't find my way home to the dilemma posed in your dream and represent it in the fourth quadrant. The thunderstorm, the hotties, <laughs> and the dancing. Create some representation of some solution. And you put it in the fourth quadrant. Okay. Have you come up with a solution? Um. It can be anything you want. It can be magical, it can be realistic, it doesn't matter. Maybe there's um, a special train station that always takes me to a safe place. Okay. Okay. So then you would draw it or represent it or you visualize it. And then as a therapist, what I'd look for is that some element in that train station that you can bring into your real life, whether it's just colors on the wall, something, or maybe I could have you go get a little miniature train that always takes you home. By the way, home is an enormously important archetype. Remember way back when I had you say, I'm home at last? Remember? Remember Carl? Nobody's home. I'm home. There's somebody home. Home is an enormously important archetype for self. We all want to find our way back home. Okay, so you get the idea of this? Find a solution and then you bring it into your life space. Okay, shift and get. Kids love doing this. Kids come with a bad dream, I have them draw it, I have them draw a solution. They can put anybody, whatever they want to do. With St. George, we'd have them put in a staff member, put in police, whoever they want. We had one kid that had terrible dreams. This kid used to love to pick up objects particularly sharp objects, but you'd have to take those away because he'd cut himself from the streets. He used to love these. He also broke more noses than anybody at St. George. He would come smashing in the face. He'd go into psychotic states. We'd have him literally in a rubber room and we'd have 24-hour coverage. A week before I left, I had to cover deer, we'll call him Arnold, overnight. He'd wake up. I'd do anything not to get my nose broken at that time. Well, oh, he used to go like this. Sniff it. Sniff it. Right in your face. Especially when you know, guests would come, touring professionals. Sniff it. Sniff it. Sniff it. Oh, I grossed everybody out. I mean, you knew you learned. It's gross. Even your own saliva. It's fascinating. He had his sacred power pouch. And we allowed him to fill it with objects that were safe. It was this leather pouch. And he would put it underneath his pillow. And here was his ode. As I enter the night sea journey, I carry my pouch of power to protect me from the demons of the dark. 
Now he says that sometimes when the demons of the dark come, he would see himself standing with his pouch of power and they would vanish. Take it down a level. Woga woga. There was a graduate student. I don't think he was at a line. He was in a clinical psychology program. It was here, or maybe he moved here. He was in a hypnosis class. Teacher was going to do a demonstration, the first demonstration of actual hypnosis. It had never been, been hypnotized. Interesting process. You don't think you're being hypnotized, and all of a sudden your hands rising, or you, you can't open your eyes. It's fascinating. One part of your mind that's saying, keep your eyes closed, is in operation, is running the Oval White House, while the other part is going, open, open, open. It's not in charge. He's just distracted. So he's being hypnotized. He seems to be a very good subject. And then, teacher says, okay, thank you so very much. It's time to come back. And he goes, well, there's a spirit up in the corner of the room, and it wants to come and talk to the class through me, and it's asking permission to do so. Whoa! Just changed the wooga wooga. Just changed the level. Uh, class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, it's okay with you? Let's see, what was his name? I know his name. John something. Uh. Yeah, okay. Yunk. Now, I don't know why they always talk in the Irish brogue or something. He talks to some like Irish brogue, has a, num a name like Ekfa or something. Hello! I know, I can't even begin to do Irish brogues. I have no idea. My, my terrible muy malo Spanish, but Irish brogue, please. But anyway, he's talking in that kind of brogue, and he's saying, yep, we're spirits, there's bad ones, there's good ones, I'm a good one, I'm here to help, we know all about you, and all this stuff, man. The teacher's like, oh, yeah, okay, fine, tell the class something about me that there's no way John would know. Are you sure you really want me to do that, really? Yeah, so of course he divulges some dark secret, and the guy's like, ah, four shades of chartreuse. Here's the problem. Ikfa didn't want to leave. Ikta found John. John's a perfect medium, vehicle, for Ikta to speak to the world. John is not a PhD psychologist. John is a psychic. He had to change professions because he had to negotiate with Ikta as to who gets to use the main screen here. And so he becomes Ikta when he's a psychic. And he gives really interesting advice. The way I got to him, by the way, because he's a friend of my ballerina clan. Because she went to psychics. And he was a really good one. So I actually referred to people to him. And he says really smart things. Like, you have trust issues. Grant's based on some form of life or whatever. So you need to go to therapy and work on it. They're really, they do video you know, tapes so that you get to listen to your tape. And, and I heard some of his tapes. Very smart man. Ooh. There was a very famous psychologist who wrote the following. I have to speak my truth. You all know me. I forgot who it was. This is in a you know, peer-reviewed journal. I simply need to tell you this truth. I was driving on the LA freeway. Suddenly there didn't seem to be much of any cars around me. You know something weird is going to happen. You know Wooga Wooga Five is around if there's no cars around you in the LA freeway. A green VW bus comes up and it's his old grad school classmate that he hasn't seen in 20 years or whatever. 10 years, I guess. What? He waves, and he waves. Like, Whoa. And he points to the exit. So he goes to the exit, and there's no cars. Nothing. Huh. Dang, I guess he must have gone on or something. You know where this is going, right? Let me take you a few steps forward, and then you know exactly where this goes. There is a reunion, lo and behold, like the next month, of that graduate class. It was a small class, like 15 of them. So he goes to the reunion, he's chatting, and he goes, hey, hey, hey where's John? Not John? Bob, whatever the guy's name was. So what does everybody say when they turn sheep white? Of course. Oh, God, you didn't hear? Bob died. What? No, 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 wait, when did he die? Oh, God, years ago. What were you talking about? No, I just saw him. You know what's weird, though? Remember how I always used to drive a Jaguar? Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't driving a Jaguar. He was driving this green VW bus. I saw him on the freeway. Everybody goes, four shades of pale, lighter shade of pale, whiter shade of pale, of the famous old song, way before your time. 
John does drive a Jaguar, or Bob. However, it broke down. So he went to a repair shop, and he was given a loaner car. And he went on the freeway in this loaner car. And he crashed into a big truck and was instantly killed. And what was the loaner car, ladies and ladies? Thank you. A green VW bus. That is my truth. Make of it what you will, said this very famous research psychologist, evidence-based. I'm not against evidence-based, whether I don't mean to mock it. Nothing wrong with that. Do with it what you will. That is his truth. By the way, I don't think if we were in that LA lane that we would see it. I think he saw it. And I think really what's underneath all this at some cosmic level is mirror neurons. That somehow our mirror neurons trigger into this whole other realm. Jung was very, very comfortable in that other realm because he believed in the collective. And he believed the collective was timeless, and that we could come into it at different points. My dear sweet mom, my mom was extremely bright. She's one of the termites. You know about termites? Termites study the top thousand brightest kids in California. And she was in the upper 10% of the top. Anyway, we're very smart. Loved to read. So when she was in school, she didn't like what they were reading, so she'd read her own. But she would be called on. But she noticed to read something or respond to something about what they were reading. What she noticed was, when she would think about being called on, she'd be called on. So she went, oh, this is simple. I'll read the little passage, bless you, do the little vibe, get called on, and then get back to my reading that I want to do. And she said it worked very well. Well, one day, she does remember what it was, but something came to her. And all she remembers saying is, I don't want this in my life, go away. And it never came back. She doesn't remember what it was. Now, when I was an undergrad, not undergrad, but I was doing the Carl thing, a grad student doing my block internship at Davis, we got every three months to do something as, as the, the grad students. And we invited a psychic, Nancy Tuppy, who's a Bay Area psychic. And she kind of does readings and whatnot. Well, the way she became a psychic is, and this happens to a lot of them, she thought she was going crazy. She would have these weird visions and whatnot. So she told her husband, what do I do? I'm having these weird visions. I feel like I either ought to check myself in get some heavy meds, or I think I might transform into somebody else. I'll still be me, but I'm going to have this other part of me. And he said, I'm right here, whatever you want to do. She says, I think I'd rather become somebody in addition to me than check myself in. And she did. And she became this kind of renowned up there psychic. She did do the, even though she's not a finder type, she was at a workshop where somebody lost a contact lens in the Olympic size swimming pool, and she said, I think it's there, and they found it. I once did a, a, um, a custody assessment of a doctor. Now, this is a custody assessment. You want to present your prefrontal cortex best. But I did. He was an interesting guy, musician, other things. And I said, you know, have you had any unusual experiences? He goes, well, that's interesting you should ask. I really wanted to experiment with being able to do out-of-body consciousness stuff. So I practiced it. And I got to the point where I remember one night my I'd hover above my bed and I'd look down at myself. Well, one time, I was doing that, I heard a noise in the kitchen. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I'd go in another room. I did, went off. And you know the funny thing is, you can't just go through the door. I said, I had to find a crack. So it's kind of like being a rat, you go underneath and squeeze out again. Oh, really? Can't you just go through the door, huh? All right, matter matters. Goes in the kitchen and it's, he looks at the clock and it's 2.03 a.m. And his mom is eating. She was visiting him at the time. And she's eating something. So then he got scared. Shit, can I get back to my body? I've never been this far away from base. Got back, no problem. And of course, the next day, mom says, you know, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up. It's been around 2 a.m. I remember looking at the clock. I was eating my cereal. Whatever. OK? So I've told this to many class. And one of the classes said, you know, it's also called synchronicity. Meaningful coincidence. Grandfather dies. They're going to have the funeral, the burial process, whatever it is they do. As they go to the car to leave, there's this huge grasshopper on the car. Which is very, when was the last time I saw a huge grasshopper in Southern California? They go to the burial site. 
and once more there's another huge grasshopper. Blah, blah, blah. They come back to the house with the urn and whatever, huge grasshopper. And of course his middle name or something meant grasshopper. So they decided to bury his ashes or whatever they did in a urn of bronze grasshopper. Okay? Let me give you one more and then I'll ask you and then I'm gonna give you one of my own. My best friend, you know my best friend, Joe McGoldrick. I told you about him. His wife, Sharon, has definitely got some psychic vibe going. And she just is. She does all kinds of weird stuff that just comes up. So here's a great one. Well, Joe's mom floss. Joe and Sharon all go out for dinner. They have a wonderful dinner. You know where this is going. They have a wonderful dinner. Come back. Floss lives just down the street in an apartment. They drop her off, go home, go to sleep, and Sharon has a dream. And the dream is that Floss comes to her, and she sits by her bed and wakes Sharon up and says, Sharon, I just want you to know I love you. I love Joey. Tell him it's all good. Tell him it's all good. Tell him I'm okay. I love you. I'm always here. You know, you know. She wakes up in the morning. She tells Joe the dreams. Guy had the weirdest dream. Mom came and she was right by my bed. She was right here. She looked with the kindest eyes and said, it's all gonna be okay. She loves me. She loves you. No, no. What happens 10 minutes later? Phone the phone call from his sister. That floss died that night. Meaningful coincidence. Let me give you a meaningful coincidence. So I'm about 16, and my mom is sick. And in those days, believe it or not, doctors came to your house. Oh my God, a house call it was called. House call. John Welsh, legend in La Jolla, California. Treated everybody. I got out of the Vietnam War because uh, I had asthma one time when I was 13, and he documented it. Gave me pills I never used, but it got me out of the war. Anyway. Would have gone to Canada. So anyway, so he comes and there's a house call, and I was concerned about my mom. So I'm leaning against the door of her to the room to hear him, and I hear him ask her, "So you've had natural births?" And she goes, "No, I had two. Two, two. Would I come out twice or something? Two. I didn't say anything, but I, I never forget. I'm like, what? It made no sense to me. I must have misheard it, but I know I didn't. Okay." Fast forward, I'm about to graduate high school. And she says, you know, someday, honey, I'm going to want to tell you some things about my life that I never told you. And maybe when you come back from college, from break, I'll tell you some stuff. OK, fine, Mom. I come back from college from break, and she says, you know, I was married before. What? You know, you're married before? Yeah. Whoa, you hussy. <laughs> I knew that she lived with Ed Ricketts, who was John Steinbeck's best friend. She was Steinbeck's right hand person, by the way. She has a really interesting history. So I knew she lived with Ricketts, but I didn't know she had, was married before that. Not only was she married, she had a daughter. What? You had a daughter? I have a, a sister? Half sister? Whatever? Yeah. Her name was Kay. What? Oh, two births. I suddenly remembered two births. Oh, wow. What happened? Kay died of a brain tumor at age 12. And it was when my mom was meeting my dad, met, and she left Ed Ricketts, and my dad was a, uh, doing a postdoc at the Marine Station up in Carmel. Cannery Road, right? Steinbeck, all that stuff. Okay? And that's one of the reasons she left and went to Israel with my dad, then Palestine, because of all this loss and this incredible stuff. Okay? Okay. Fast forward, many years later, my dear sweet, Nine, now she's about 92 years old. Mother. And my God bless you, Roy Devine. Wife says, she's getting too old to live alone up there in the Muirland's home. She's going to live with us. You sure you want to do that? Really? Yeah. It's going to be fine. Cool. Tone, you're living with us. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go up and we pack up stuff and blah, 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 blah. All right, we're moving her in and whatnot. 
took about a week or so, and kind of the last day, she's packing up some of her own stuff. She calls. She says, honey, you won't believe this. I just came across a poem from Kay that she wrote. Let's see if I can get through this. Let me read it to you. March 22nd, God, 1944. Here's the poem. I am a little wave with white shoes and a dress with lace. I go and I come forever and forever more. K. Jackson, March 22nd, 1944. I'm a wave. I'm a wave. I'm a little wave. I've been carrying my sister for all these years on my wedding ring, and I didn't even know it. I've been drawing waves since I was 12 years old. Hmm. I have waves all over my wall throughout my adolescence. I go to Rincon three hours there and three hours back on a heartbeat to catch a wave. Wow. Meaningful coincidence. Now let's just took one more notch. And when was K. Jackson born. Do you remember this number? The very first time we met, I put that number in the corner. She was born on November 3rd, and it was 1937. Who was also born on November 3rd? My best friend, Joe McGoldrick. And I just found that out like two years ago. And I go over to him and I hug him. I go, Joey! Not only are you my brother, you're my sister. You were born on the same day, November 3rd. Go figure. Now I know that's one out of 365 chances. Meaningful coincidence. Maybe there's more going on, evidence-based or otherwise, than we know. Well, but this part knows. This part knows very well because we are the life force power of the universe. And that part knows very well. And kids are very close to that. And other cultures, when I say this stuff, they're like, yeah, and the sky is blue and the sun is yellow. Wow, cool. It's like, what else is new? Native Americans, a lot of the Hispanic cultures, a lot of cultures are very comfortable with this other reality. Okay? Thank you for this. Go live out your reality this week. Synchronous or otherwise.